We're now looking at a topic called transfer pricing. Now, all that transfer pricing is, is the pricing of the exchange of goods or services between divisions. The issue, of course, is that it is all internal to the company as a whole. And from that perspective, you have to question why it is important. So, the pricing of trade between divisions of goods and services. Shouldn't make much difference whether they are goods or services, but I'm inclined to think that your examiner likes to talk about services. So it may well be that we are trading services rather than goods. Now, if we look at the basic idea, what we have is a supplying division. The one that supplies the goods or service, and we have a buying division. And if we set some sort of transfer price, all we have to remember is this very simple fact. We've got revenue here, and we've got cost here. Now, before we go any further, let's just highlight this point. We're looking at two divisions that are part of a wider group or company. And from that perspective, will it affect the overall group profit? Well, the answer is no. This is internal. The revenue and the cost should cancel out. And so, from a direct impact on profit, there is none. On that basis, why is it that transfer pricing is at all important? The first one, the first reason, is simply this. When we look at divisional performance, we are particularly concerned that decisions make decisions that are consistent with overall company profit maximization. So if we were looking at goal congruent decision making here, we have to make sure that the transfer price encourages individual decisions to make the appropriate decision. There's a very simple rule. The general rule in goal congruent decision making is that the transfer price equals the opportunity cost of that transaction. The opportunity cost to both parties. Now the fact is, uh, the opportunity cost will differ depending on the circumstances of the trade. For example, if there is an external market for the good that is being transferred internally, the opportunity cost could simply be the external market price. No problem there. If, however, there is no market, the good is only transferred inter internally and there is no market externally, it's possible that the opportunity cost is a marginal cost. Or, alternatively, if there is any form of constraint or limitation in the supplying division, we may find that the opportunity cost is the marginal cost plus some contribution measure to reflect the fact that there is scarcity in the supplying division. Now, this is a subject in its own right. But looking at what the examiners put in the syllabus, I really don't think we need to know much in this area. All we have to be aware of is the general rule. 
What we're much more interested in is the impact of the transfer price on individual divisions. Whether it encourages them to work hard or not. So we could look at fair performance evaluation. And this is what I'm sort of expecting to see. You see, when we talk about fair performance evaluation, I suppose what I'm saying is this. If possible, we want to make sure that both parties, both divisions, will gain something out of the trade. The issue is, what is fair? If I said, is life fair, you're likely to say, well, not really, not for me. So when we're talking about fair performance evaluation, I suppose the first thing we could say is that if at all possible, an externally determined transfer price is fair. We could start with that premise. What I'm saying is that if there is an external market, we're effectively treating the divisions as autonomous, wholly separate units. And if they were trading in an external market, that is the price at which they would trade. But of course, life is never that simple. It's highly unlikely that we will have that situation. As such, if there is no market, no external market for this good, what sort of alternatives could we use? Well, in simple terms here, we could use any cost that we deem is the most appropriate. We may decide to value the transfer at marginal cost or at full cost or at full cost plus some sort of margin. So, given that we've got this, which is fair and to whom? Now, I'm expecting us to be given quite a lot of numbers in any question. And from that perspective, we simply want to look at the impact of doing these sorts of things with each individual trade. And we want to know whether the supplying division and the buying division are happy or unhappy. So if we were to look at that idea, the sort of things I'm looking at are these. If we have our transfer price, what is the impact on the supplying division? And what is the impact on the buying division? Now remember, I'm talking in abstract here. Your examiner is likely to give you lots of numbers, but I'm just going to give you a basic overview. If the price is based on the marginal cost, what can we say about the supply division? Will they be happy? Well, if they are charging solely the marginal cost on to the buying division, they're only going to cover their marginal costs, they will not even cover the fixed costs. Fixed costs are not covered and therefore we would expect to be in a loss-making position. Whereas if we're looking at it from a buying division, I'm terribly happy here. All contribution is earned in the buying division. So, one angle. The supply division would be extremely unhappy and the buying division would be almost euphoric with happiness. Then we look at full cost or total cost. 
All costs are covered. No problem. So we would see the supply division being slightly happier here. But hold on a moment. But no profit. So still we could say all the profit is earned in the buying division. So we could use full cost, but again, there's not much of an incentive here for the supplying division to do anything very special. Or what we could argue is that we have some sort of full cost plus margin. So what we see is that they will make a profit here. Um, and the question mark is profit may or may not be earned in the buying division. In fact, it's possible that they could even make a loss if too much profit is given back to the supplying division. Now, you could argue, just looking at this, that of the three that I've suggested, and of course, there are many other ways that we could set the price. Of the three I've suggested, maybe the last one is possibly the fairest. But at the same stage, you have to wonder exactly where you want the profits to arise and how complicated the system to be. Another issue, before we move on, is do we want to value at the standard or actual cost? Let's start with the standard cost. The standard cost is the expected cost, the cost established in the budget. Now, if we're looking at standard cost, you could argue that this is the sensible one to use. That means that any variances are suffered by the supplying division. And the buying division, therefore, will be using some sort of expected cost. We generally suggest that the standard cost is what we should do, because of course, if the supplying division does a good job, they should benefit from favourable variances. And if the supply and division does an appallingly bad job, they should suffer from the variances and not pass them on to the buying division. OK, well, that's all well and good. Um, but is there a problem with this? You could argue that it places an enormous amount of stress on the budgeting system. Because you can see that it is critical for both divisions to establish that the expected or standard cost that is set is fair. And you could also argue that there are some costs that you know will change. I think we all know that, say, the cost of oil bounces up and down quite a lot. And maybe it's important that we should pass those costs on to the buying division to reflect the true cost of doing business. The third area that we have to be aware of with regard to transfer pricing is divisional autonomy. When we're looking at anything to do with divisional performance appraisal, we always argue that the divisions should be autonomous. That means that the divisions should be able to make decisions regarding what they do. And based on that, we could argue that the transfer price should be set by discussions between the buying and the supplying division. Can we allow that to happen? Well, the answer is this. Although theoretically, it's a good idea. If we allow the buying and supplying divisions to set their own price, it is unlikely that they will set a price that we ourselves would be happy with. As such, 
when we're looking at setting transfer prices, unfortunately, we have to take this away from the divisions and set it at head office. In simple terms, the transfer price is too important to leave to negotiation between divisions. The reasons for this. One, it is likely that it will reflect different training that people have in individual divisions the degree of seniority, one imposing their transfer price on another division. And as such, it is likely that the setting of the transfer price will be unrational. It will be based on a whole host of factors that should not come into play. Secondly, it is almost guaranteed to lead to conflict. Because within the overall organization. One of the easiest ways for your division to generate a better return will be to simply push and push and push to change the transfer price. When in fact what they should be focusing on is looking at external factors rather than internal factors. I know this for real. Many years ago when I had a proper job, I used to set transfer prices. Nothing too sophisticated. And before the ink was dry on the information that I was sending out to each and every other division, I was getting demands back stating that the transfer prices that I have set are inappropriate, too high, etc., etc., etc. We don't want conflict. It's very possible we'll get conflict for many other reasons between divisions and we wish to minimise it. So these are the sort of reasons why, although we would like divisions to set their own transfer prices from an autonomy basis, we're not going to let it happen in practice. Remember, when we're looking at transfer pricing, it is likely to be part of a wider divisional performance appraisal issue. And as such, all we have to remember is that the transfer price will be a revenue for one division, a cost for another, and therefore it will have to be built in to the overall profit measure that we use for either maybe return on investment calculations or residual income. Okay, there may be a few numbers, but if you remember, we've just got an extra revenue there maybe, and an extra cost there, it's not going to be too difficult at all.